Thank you so much. Y'all, thanks for coming out. This is really, really nice of you. I see some of you whispering. You think you got ripped off? 14-year-old kids getting up here to talk to you. That's cool. That's cool. Very happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ford. Love what you guys are doing. It's very, very inspiring. It's also the only place I can get wine without getting carded. So... I thank you for that. Can you guys see and hear everything okay? We're going to tell uh, some stories and look at some photos tonight, relax, and have a good time. It's fun. You're in the splash spit zone, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Cover your wine. Um, so I'm a conservation photographer, and uh, what I do is travel around to different places and shoot photos and tell stories. And I've been to a lot of pretty great places. This is, this is Ecuador. I, I was there in 2005. And this is on the active volcano Pachincha overlooking actually the city of Quito is just below that. And then in the distance, the Cayambe volcano, also a very active volcano. Quito is in a pretty tight spot there. Um, but this is a really fascinating place, and especially for me as a, as a young guy, I'm not really 14. This is back when I was 21 then, uh, so you can do the math. And uh, it's a fantastic place. Ecuador is a tiny little country, but they have volcanoes, and they have Potomo, and they have all these different natural resources. They have Amazon rainforest, and of course they have the Galapagos too. Fantastic place. And for me as a as a young photographer just coming up, this is, you know, eye candy city. So I was there actually studying international politics and policy as well as Spanish and, and photography and environmental science. Great place to do it, and especially international politics because in 2005, we, we didn't cover it much here in the States, but this was during the overthrow, the presidential overthrow of Lucio Gutierrez who is a corrupt president, and so the people revolted, in which they do in Ecuador. They're very efficient at it. I think at that time they'd gone through 10 presidents in the last five years. <laughs> very efficient at it. And so I'm so excited to, you know, be on the first front lines of my first political revolt, and, and I'm going out and, you know, tear gas is coming down from the sky. I'm writing my parents saying, this is the best. I'm getting... <laughs> A great, great education, you know, best education for international politics and policy right there. And it really planted that seed of, of going out this kind of photojournalistic style of telling a story of a place and where I was and, and how these natural factors and these human factors are, are combining. And so soon after that, after I graduated, uh, I headed down to Honduras and I lived there for two years. Just, uh, just above La Ceiba, in, in, the, in the mountains of the Nombre de Dios and the Pico Bonito uh, tropical forest, right in between those two. And in between those two is a river, is the Congrejao River. And I lived in this small little community, and these people had a direct relationship with the natural world. They were dependent on it. A lot of them raised their crops in there. A lot of them hunted there. A lot of them, you know, went out and, and would go out and cut trees and find ways of, of using this natural area to sustain themselves. And so it was a fantastic place. And the point of my being there was to use photography to teach kids how to uh, appreciate their backyard. So we would put cameras in the hands of kids and let them go out and explore, that, let them make their own photos. Because it's, a, it's an important system because you have these primary forests, which then lead into this class five river, which then pours out into the delta there in the Caribbean, which then fuels the system for the second largest barrier reef. So you have this connected watershed, and you have these people that are not only dependent on the wildlife and, and these natural systems, uh, but when you, have, when you have these areas of, of rich uh, natural bounty, you end up having problems in a lot of these places, especially places where it's hard for people to make a living. So poaching becomes an issue there. And you start having, you know, these clashes of, of people and nature and right at that line where I really like to ride, where I, I really like to photograph. Um, so every day I go up and down this mountain road, uh, it would sometimes get washed out by this river. I'd have to hitchhike or I'd mountain bike up this thing. But every time I would go, I would go past this, this waterfall and it was called Behuco Falls. And it was this massive torrent that was coming down from this primary forest. 
And every time I'd go past this waterfall, I would think I'm going to photograph this in, in, in a new way. I've got to find some cool way to shoot this thing because it was really impressive to see. So I decided to go up one morning, see what it looked like at, at sunrise in the early morning light and got up there and, you know, you have the sun rising over the Nombre de Dios mountain range and then you have the Congreja River there running in. And so I wanted to show how that water coming from a primary, a protected forest is, is fueling that river. And this photo didn't quite do it because this, this waterfall looks kind of measly and, and, and weak. So I, I got to thinking, which I often do, which often gets me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I got to thinking, I started talking with some of the local guides down there. And I, I, I thought maybe, hey, I, you know, I'm going to rappel down this waterfall and shoot it halfway down, you know, as the sun's coming up. And so I started talking. Yeah, you guys don't like that. <laughs> I sound like my parents. <coughs> so I start talking to a, a local guide and I say, Darwin, and he, he's been all over this place and he knows he grew up on this river. I say, Darwin, how, how tall is this waterfall? And Hondurans, if you have any Honduran friends, best people in the world, love those people. They are so nice to a fault because they will lie to you <laughs> <laughs> just, just so they think they're helping you because they don't want to say, oh, I, I don't know, I'm sorry. I say, Darwin, how tall is this waterfall? He goes, 100 feet. <laughs> I go, 100 feet? He goes, 100 feet. I was like, great, I got 150 foot of rope. I'm all set. <laughs> so I headed up to the top and, and I start rappelling down this waterfall. And this is, you know, pre-dawn I'm doing this. And so going down, and if you know these waterfalls waterfalls are typically convex like that right so you get you have to go down 50 feet or so before you can actually see the bottom and that was my plan i'd rappel down and then i'd be able to rappel all the way down after i shot my photo then hike back up retrieve the rope well i get 50 feet down and notice that my rope is just dangling like a noodle <laughs> about 50 feet <laughs> over these rocks and oh, darwin <laughs> So he, he was wrong. It's about 150, 180 foot tall waterfall. And so I didn't really have a backup plan, but I did have these, these uh, ropes that I used to tie my, my tripod up with. So I made little prussics and I just inched my way back up. Finally made it up. I'm still here, obviously. And I got the shot. Is it worth it? Yeah? Cool. Good. <laughs> I think so. I hope so. Yeah, this stuff is fun and it's fun to come up with these ideas and it's fun to pursue them and it's fun to problem solve when you get stuck in that situation you didn't anticipate. And recently I, I was uh, assigned by the Save Our Seas Foundation to go down to South Africa and to Cape Town. If any of y'all have been there, you might, you might know this place. This is, this is False Bay. So this is right where the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans meet. And this is a spectacular place because it's a, it's a temperate wilderness. And these granitic shores are really beautiful. These, they lead into these kelp forests down underwater. And the water is nothing like our water here. It's very, very cold. And I learned that the first day I went diving. But y'all might know False Bay for being famous for one particular thing. If you've ever seen um, Shark Week, that's pretty much where it's filmed. It's filmed in False Bay because they have a really high concentration of great white sharks. And that's typically the story that's told in False Bay. But False Bay also has 27 other species of sharks. Sharks that don't quite fit that mold of gnarly teeth and, you know, always coming to bite you. This is the pajama cat shark. <laughs> yeah. Gets to wear pajamas all day, hangs out. Tiny little guy, he's like this. They're like little, little puppy dogs, they just swim and they nuzzle on you. Really cool. Yeah, 27 other species of sharks. There's also the shy shark. Gets its name because when it gets agitated or scared, it takes its fin and it curls it over its eyes and then drops to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, that's a shark. How about that? Isn't that cool? It's very cool. They also have the largest concentration of seven gill cow sharks in the world. Over 70 of them just hang out in these kelp forests. Very, very unnerving thing to be swimming. You don't have very good visibility, so you see these 12 foot shadows just coming in and out. But they're, they're docile. They're, I mean, they're delightful. They have little Muppet mouths, you know? <laughs> so, how can you not love those sharks? They're so cool. 
But false bay, just like any other system, is governed by these, these abiotic and these biotic factors that, that make it up. And yes, there are white sharks. There are great white sharks in false bay. And what's interesting is what happens. So if you've seen Shark Week, you see them launch out of the water as they're hunting these uh, Cape fur seals. Well, that's in the winter because when the summer rolls around, they actually leave Seal Island and they start heading inshore. And inshore in Cape Town is a very popular place for surfers. It's one of the most popular surfing destinations in the world for beginner surfers. So they start heading inshore, not because we smell good or anything like that, but they're chasing these shoals of fish because as the waters warm up, shoals of fish move inland and that's where they go. And so all these different species of sharks, the bronze whalers, the hammerheads, the great whites, all these sharks are now moving inshore because the summertime is rolling around. People are catching them in their seine nets is how close they are. They're coming in with the breakers. Well, as waters warm up in the summer, we know this better than anyone. What do we do in the summer? Yeah, that's right. We go to the beach in the summer. The sharks go to the beach in the summer. Everyone wants to go to the beach in the summer. <laughs> it's a great time. But it's also, you know, a very vulnerable time here in, in South Africa and False Bay. And especially in this area where you have this burgeoning population of more and more people using the water and more and more sharks coming in. You can't just kill your sharks because they're keystone species. And so you end up having oftentimes these, these negative interactions between sharks and people. Sometimes it's inevitable. This is Ahmad Hasim. Uh, he's actually a, a Paralympic medalist now. He was bit in Musenberg in False Bay. And he's actually now one of the most outspoken voices for shark conservation out there. And why? Well, because he knows you've got to share the water with sharks. You eliminate the sharks, you get a collapse in everything else. You get a collapse in the fishery, you get a collapse in the seals, you get a collapse in everything. They're a keystone species. So what does Cape Town do? They say, we have a problem. A shark bite is not only bad for people, it's also bad for business. Because who wants to go learn how to surf now in the rollers of Musenberg when, when you've got sharks rolling around? So Cape Town and the Save Our Seas Foundation came up with a unique solution. We have a problem, we're going to solve it. We're going to try to solve it in a, in a sustainable way. So they gave jobs to these, these, uh, these underprivileged youth and adults that are living in these townships that are right on the you know, periphery of Cape Town. They give them full-time jobs. They call them shark spotters. Put one person on top of these coastal escarpments, one person down on the beach. You see a shark coming in. You radio down, you hoist up a flag, you say sharks are in the water, and the surfers get out. Some people don't pay quite as much attention to others. But what you have done is you've now given full-time jobs to underprivileged people. You're, you're giving an opportunity to educate the public on this new program, and you're keeping sharks safe and people safe. Isn't that cool? That is cool. That is awesome. And I love to hear stories like this of we have a problem, how do we solve it in, in an environmentally and sustainable way that's good for the economy and good for people. We like that. My most, my most recent story brought me back to the southeast, which is where I, I love to work the most, uh, on, on a really fun story on a, on a unique bird. Now these are swallowtail kites. You know these birds? probably see them around here. They're fascinating birds, really fascinating birds. Uh, the Native Americans actually had a sacred word for them. They were called tansabe. So they were this heralded bird in their culture, and they still are for us today. We see tattoos of them all over the place. If you've seen uh, the Florida birding trail signs, that's the, the swallowtail kite. They've become this, this symbol for conservation in the southeast. And why, why is that? Well, it's because these birds occupied at once, one time, they occupied a 21 state area. And today they're down to six states, six state distribution. So their numbers have dropped dramatically. And so I went out into the field. I, I used this assignment as an excuse to get certified, certified uh, to climb trees, uh, to buy a bunch of equipment basically, uh, to climb trees, to follow biologists in the field who are learning tons about these birds. So. What's really interesting about the swallowtail kite is that they nest in, in these loblolly pines and in these cypress trees. And they don't, they don't just choose any old loblolly or any old cypress. They choose the most emergent tree in the canopy. 
you know, some, some birds are very picky. The swallowtail kite is really picky because they only want the tallest trees, the trees that look out over the rest of the canopy. Well, you start asking yourself, why did this bird go from 21 states down to six states? Well, it's because if they're occupying the tallest and the largest and the most robust trees, those are also the ones that we wanted. And so when we started spreading out over the southeast and really seeing all these, these primary forests and all these southern forests as resources for us to you know, build ships or to build homes and all these other things, uh, we ended up destroying a lot of that habitat for the swallowtail. And today they're facing a new problem, a very real problem. Climate change is definitely affecting uh, their southern forests and these coastal areas. These, these, these coastal swamps, these cypress forests where they nest and where they feed and where they raise their young uh, are slowly turning into this, these skeletal landscapes. And these salinity changes as sea levels are rising are really changing things dramatically. And this is not hyperbole here. This is, this is real and this is happening. I would talk to fishermen who would say, yeah, you know, I used to fish here in this area 15 years ago for smallmouth bass, right here, smallmouth. This is where dolphins are now. Things are changing quickly in these southern swamps and these areas. But I got onto this assignment not only to do the, the climate change and natural history stuff, but because of one thing I heard about swallowtails that makes them very interesting, other than different, different raptors and birds, is that they're very social. And that's, that's strange for a raptor, they're, that they're social. So they get into these large feeding aggregations where before migration, they'll get together and they'll come above these melon fields or these agricultural fields, and they'll start hunting some of these June bugs. It looks huge on the screen, but this thing's about this big. Uh, these June bugs are stink bugs. And what's cool about swallowtails is that they don't stop flying. When they're feeding, they feed on the wing. So they're able to target these, these, uh, these June bugs and these stink bugs with, with such precision. It was so difficult to photograph because I couldn't actually see the bugs. I would just have to cue into when their talons raise. And so they don't stop flying because when they catch that bug, they then transfer it to their beak and then they keep flying and they'll do it over and over again. Very cool. And to see 400 of these birds doing it at the same time, really interesting. But then it gets better. 400 birds is nothing. Because then what happens after they're done with their, their feeding aggregations, right before they go and migrate down in Central and South America, they then they get together in these roosting aggregations totaling around four to 5,000 birds, which is roughly 50% of the U.S. population in one place in one morning. Really, really cool. Yeah. So I wanted to see what this looked like from the ground. So I headed down to the ground, and I'm in, this is in the southern Everglades. And I'm, I'm by myself in this very remote area and just kind of waiting, you know, waiting for something to happen because tree, you know, birds on a tree is not that exciting. You want, you want something to go on, some behavior. Preening's okay, I guess, too, but not that exciting. So I'm just sitting there waiting for something to happen. And all of a sudden, I start hearing this tearing, this screaming coming from the woods and just like a <coughs> do-do, 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 like crazy, you know. Well, it probably didn't sound like that. I think I'm maybe exaggerating, but it did sound really, really frightening. And the first thing I thought was panther. And then sure enough, it comes out into the clearing and it was a coyote. And he's just howling and he's freaking out. And as soon as he does that, as soon as he starts howling, 4,000 birds took to the sky. <laughs> that is a cool sound to hear and to see. Amazing. All these little processes that are, that are happening just right under our noses, these little things in these hidden areas. I love this stuff. And this is what I do. This is what I'm into. It's really fun. And, and I think people have an inflated idea about what it is that conservation photography is. There are definitely times like this where you get to you know, fly 800 feet with the doors off photographing wonderful landscapes. But have you, ever, <laughs> have you ever seen those memes on Facebook where it's like what, what my friend or what I think it is that I do and then what my friends think it is that I do? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then what, what I actually do. <laughs> that's, that's more like it. This is accurate to a T. I'm a wetland and I'm a swamp photographer. So believe it or not, this is actually my comfort zone. That's my happy place. And uh, I go around and I photograph all kinds of things. And I think 
for a lot of us, uh, for us photographers, is that even in those dark moments, like being broken down on the side of, of dead dog road in the Everglades in the summer, no less, instead of saying, I got to get out of here, I say, well, I'm going to just set up a camera. Let's see what this looks like. And I take pictures of everything. I do. I take pictures of everything because I love it. It's so much fun. I put up a, a hint, <laughs> much to my wife's dismay, I take pictures of everything. I, uh, <laughs> I, put, I put up a, a hidden camera when I proposed to her in, in, in Wyoming. Yeah, that's sweet. That is sweet. <laughs> she didn't know. And she was, so, she was so mad. You took pictures of that? And then I showed her the photo. She's like, okay, that's kind of cool. <laughs> And then I did it again uh, a year later when we got married. I put up a hidden camera in a tree in, uh, on Kanapaw Prairie. And, and <laughs> yeah, she, she realized as I'm walking down the aisle with my remote trigger in my hand, <laughs> she's not only marrying me, she's marrying all of my camera gear too. And I like doing this stuff because I like telling stories because stories are, are what help connect us, right? It helps, helps put context to things. And especially for, for, for us, we live in the, in the Southeast, this connection between people and, and these natural areas that uh, allow us to be here in the first place is so important, so important to show this connection, to show these areas. Because at least for me, I grew up flipping through magazines and National Geographic and, and looking at these faraway places and say, oh, I want to go there. I want to see that because I'm a visual person and, and I use what I see to teach me than what I eventually know. And I think a lot of us are like that. So how are we going to then expect the same people who don't want to go wade out into a wetland or a swamp physically, how are we going to get those people to then advocate on behalf of their protection? We can't expect that, really. We don't. So my job then is to use my camera as a communication tool to help bridge that gap between the science and the aesthetics to get people on board, to get them thinking and caring. And we <laughs> we have, we're sneaky people, photographers. We have a lot of fun ways of doing stuff like this, of taking photos where the audience has to say, well, n wait a minute, where's... Where's the photographer here? And I like doing that because it makes people stay a little longer in the photo. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you'll notice I don't have a wedding ring on in that photo. Uh, definitely a simpler time when I was allowed to wear Crocs and socks at the same time. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I haven't seen those Crocs since I said I do. <laughs> but we set up these camera traps and these hidden cameras because it allows us for an instant, a little window into these secret worlds that we wouldn't otherwise get. And I love doing this stuff. And I'll take it even further. You know, even after shooting this, I'm never satisfied. I'll then dig a hole and then put my camera in the hole to look up and see, see what it looks like from a bug's eye perspective. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. That's so crazy looking. It's fun. It's cool to do. And I started doing this in high school fi about 16 years ago, believe it or not. Yeah, 16 years ago. And I just started exploring these places behind my house, uh, just filled with all this rich wildlife. And, and not just rich wildlife, but the wildlife that was Florida's bl brand of wildlife that was unique here. And I fell in love with that because to me, it helped identify that place where I lived and what I called home. Finding these, these little moments where Florida just showed itself, even just for an instant. And, you know, I get close to wildlife a lot. And I try, because this is the way I feel about Florida, is that we live in this kind of modern Jurassic state. We live with all kinds of ancient reptiles. And so I try to take photos that show that, making things look bigger than they are, because that's the way I feel. And sometimes they let me uh, get close. Sometimes they've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kindly move on and, and shoot something else. But what was interesting is that the more I photograph Florida and Gainesville, my home state, the more I realized that I didn't have to go to all these crazy foreign places. I could, I could shoot stuff right here in my backyard. And so 
I would keep doing it. I would repeat over and over, even the same subject. I'd shoot this oak tree, a tree that every tree wants to be. I mean, look at that tree. It's crazy, beautiful. And I'd shoot it at sunrise and I'd say, well, what does it look like at midnight when the fog rolls in? Yeah, that's cool. Well, what does it look like, you know, if I put a strobe behind the tree, maybe leave the shutter open for, for 10 minutes? Yeah. So when are you really done? I'm never done. There's, there's, just, there's just instances and there's times where, okay, I think I've done an okay job, but I'm never quite done. And this is what I like about photography is it keeps pushing you to find that essence and that soul. And so one day, this is in Gainesville. It's actually near my parents' house. One day I'm going down to visit my parents and my mom is so sweet. She's the best cook. And uh, she's, Mac, you know, are you going to have dinner with us tonight? And I say, oh, you know, that's right at sunset time, Mom. That's kind of (laughs) hard. She's like, okay, I just made pecan encrusted fish. (laughs) Oh, all right, yeah, I'm totally going to eat dinner. And so I go and eat dinner, and I'm sitting there, and I'm constantly looking over my shoulder (laughs) because I'm looking out the window, and I see the storm rolling in, and the sun is setting, and it's the best conditions you could possibly have. And I say, Mom, I'm sorry, I love you. got to go. Grab my camera, headed out the door because this was happening. Yeah, it always surprises you, always surprises you. And this is what I love about photography and the natural world and especially the sunshine state. This is a fantastic place to breed this sort of, 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 of wonderment, right? And so this is what I try to do with photography is to encourage that sense of curiosity too. <laughs> These are fun birds. This isn't Photoshop to me. This is real, <laughs> which makes it even crazier. You know these birds? These are burrowing owls. Yeah, yeah diurnal little birds about that big. Dr. Seuss eyes, cool birds. So most of the time when you see them, yeah, they're like angry birds. <laughs> <laughs> Super judgy. Don't look at that bird the wrong way. <laughs> when you see them, they, uh, they have, you're usually looking at them through a telephoto lens, which makes that you know, landscape very compact and it's a, a small angle of view. But I wanted to find a, a, a different way to shoot this. And so these birds were out at this, this airfield that I would go to, to contract pilots um, to do some aerial work. And I would see them out in the field standing on top of these road cones. And I talked to the land manager. I said, well, what's going on? What's going on here? He's like, yeah, those are our burrowing owls. I said, well, what's going on here? He said, well, we put out the road cone. So when our landscape company comes, they don't mow over the burrows. I say, oh, how about that? He goes, yeah, pretty cool. I go, so they're used to road cones. He says, yeah. I said, well, that sounds good to me. (laughs) (laughs) So I grabbed the road cone and I carved out a hole in my camera, put put a strobe in the the bottom of it and set it out there. And within minutes, a burrowing owl shows up. You can see him down there in the bottom left. You see him? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's perfect. So well camouflaged, but too well camouflaged because where's the bird looking? Yeah, he's looking the other way. He's not looking at the camera. So for a while, I was just getting (laughs) photos like this, which which is kind of cool, but not really what I was after. So... I had to go back to the drawing board. And again, it's about problem solving. What are you going to do? How are you going to fix this thing? So I realized on my camera, I have a beep function that you can have it programmed to beep right before it clicks the shutter. So go beep, beep, and then click. And so I go back, and I put it back in the road cone. And just immediately, it goes beep, beep, and click. And you get <laughs> 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 it's never, never. It never gets old. <laughs> and I did this. I did this for a while. I just kept setting it out and just getting the craziest stuff. <laughs> and it was so much fun. Because you don't, you know, you're not getting that angry bird look anymore. You're getting something that is just totally different, totally different, curious. And, and what is that? And sometimes, you know, they, these birds, they do just look for predators and watch clouds all day. But sometimes when you're doing these projects, it finally coalesces into that, that one frame and that one image that, 
makes them look a little more than, than just a bird. It has character. It is, it's, this one's almost distinguished, kind of got his chest out. Love that. It's so much fun to do. And this is what fascinates me about the Sunshine State, is that we have dinosaurs that live underwater here. Yeah. We've got fish that look like dinosaurs. We even have birds that act like fish. <laughs> but especially, and my favorite, is that we have mermaids. Yeah. yeah. Big, beautiful, gassy, hairy mermaids. <laughs> They're cool. I love manatees. This state is full of things that can inspire us, places that you have to re-look at and say, is that, is that really here? Is that really in the U.S.? And it sure is. And a lot of people will see this tree and they see, oh, well, that's a beautiful cypress. Well, I don't just see a, a cypress tree. I see when I look at this as an entire weekend. <laughs> And I'm serious. I'm serious. I saw that tree for the first time and said, I'm, I'm going to come back and I'm going to sleep in that tree. And I did. And I spent a whole weekend doing it. Kind of obsessively <laughs> obsessive about it because this photo wasn't enough. I had to wait one more evening when the moon would rise just up above the horizon, paint that low angular light. But the best part about this is not one, just sleeping in a tree because that's cool. But two, is, is the byproduct of just getting out getting out and going to see these things. Because yes, I went there to shoot this photo, but I was rewarded with so many other things. This hierarchy of egrets and vultures and trees, I didn't know that happened. I was surprised by it. Wake up the next morning, you see trees walking on water. And this is just a byproduct of the original purpose for going out. And that's what's so much fun about doing this stuff, is that you, know, you go out, and you see things that you were never expected to see. And I think opening yourself up and allowing yourself to be surprised is half of it. So that's what I encourage people to do. I encourage them to explore the woods, to go check out the swamps and put their head underwater and see what we've got. Because what we've got here is very, very, very special. I've been photographing all over the world, and I can honestly tell you that what we have here in the Sunshine State rivals anything else that I've seen. And it doesn't always look this great. You know, yes, this is nice. And sometimes it, it looks like crap. <laughs> but we go back to those, those beautiful moments and these moments that surprise us. And this is why I like the profession. It's fun. But so many of the habitats that dominate Florida that that, that control these natural systems are these swamps and wetlands. And swamp, in a way, has become a four-letter word. People say they're dirty and they're dangerous and they're gross and they're smelly and they're even spooky and, and haunted. <laughs> and, and I get it. You know, a long time ago, we didn't have uh, DEET. We didn't have air conditioning, but we have those things today. We can enjoy these places now. So this negative mentality shouldn't, shouldn't be able to pervade this new mindset. These places are phenomenal. These places are full of life. <coughs> and they define this state because we are surrounded by water. And yet for centuries, these swamps and these wetlands have been regarded as these second-class ecosystems really only fit for, for draining or development. And it's because they weren't very commercially valuable. You could cut the timber, but then you're left with a wetland. And, and that wasn't worth a lot of money to people. And so we just started draining them. And in, in fact, draining a swamp to make way for, for agriculture and development was considered the very essence of conservation not too long ago. And sure, you know, I get that these places, they have their things. They've got some mosquitoes. Yeah, they have alligators and they have snakes. <laughs> Any young photographers out there? I used to use photos like this to, to leverage long telephoto lenses out of my parents. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great tool. <laughs> Gonna need that 500 millimeter, Mom. <laughs> But we're, we're learning a lot about swamps now. Now that we've protected some, we're learning a lot of things. 
And I'd go out and I'd put my camera out into these areas, into these, into these sodden landscapes and, and find things. I didn't actually ride this alligator to get the photo. <laughs> I put a, a little magic arm out and put it on a time lapse. And, and I set it out there for two weeks and you would see this, this daily traffic of sunbathers. Yeah, really cool. Stuff you would never get to see otherwise because you paddle up to these things and what do they do? They, they, yeah, they're gone. Forget it. They're gone. So these remote cameras really help to see things that we wouldn't ordinarily see. You know, yes, I got a few cameras pretty wet, these, these series, but I got to see this. <laughs> <laughs> never, <laughs> never knew that happened. <laughs> That's cool. And again, sometimes during these projects, it, it it boils down, it distills into that one frame that then defines the series where the animals take on a more than just reptilian form. There's, there's character, you know, there's mood, there's emotion there, and that's what I go for. Another fascinating thing that we're learning about in swamps, since we protected a, a few of these still remaining virgin stands, did someone say protho? Prothonotary? Yes, that's prothonotary. These guys are great, and anyone who knows me knows I love these birds, and I always sing their praises. They're so cool, and they're tiny little swamp birds. It's a swamp bird, and it doesn't have fangs or gnarly talons or anything like that. It's just a beautiful little bird, and they mate, and they breed, and they nest in these old-growth swamps. Now, they're one of two cavity-nesting warblers in the U.S., and cavity-nesting means that they lay their eggs in holes in things. And so they need these swamps and these wetlands, these ephemeral uh, flooded forests, because it keeps them safe from predators. This water is like their moat, their big, big moat. And so they like these old growth forests because it's a complete system. It has new growth. It has old stuff. It has decaying matter, enough for them to be able to find this complete system to live and breed and uh, reproduce happily. And so scientists are beginning to study them. Well, why do they like these old growth areas? What's, what's unique about this migratory species? So they set out these little decoys and they catch them in these mist nets and then they put on little geolocators, which are just adorable little backpacks. The <laughs> birds love them. And then <laughs> after they equip them and they band them, they then release them and they let them go back to doing their thing. And what the scientists have begun to realize after tracking their movements is that this bird it's a migratory species. It will fly 5,000 miles over the Gulf of Mexico when the winter rolls around. And it'll winter in Central and South America. And then when the spring rolls around with its young, it will then fly all the way back 5,000 miles. Yeah, a tiny little bird. And when it comes back, it not only goes to the same state or the same region or the same river system, it goes right back to the same exact tree. That is crazy. That is crazy. I mean, we can't get around without GPS anymore. <laughs> and this bird can fly 10,000 miles and locate a random tree in a swamp. It's pretty incredible stuff. And despite all this rich life that abounds, swamps still have a bad name. People get that bad taste in their mouth when they talk about them. Ooh, I don't know, that's scary. And I get it. <laughs> I get it. We have things in our water that humble us. And when we stick our toes in the water, we know that we're not top dog anymore. But I like that. I think that's something we can embrace. Because how often do we get that feeling anymore? Do we get to feel vulnerable? Or do we actually get to think that maybe the world isn't entirely made just for us? And I, and I go after that feeling. Yeah. I go after that feeling all the time, and I try, to, I try to translate the word swamp into maybe something a little more beautiful, into a little something more intimate. A snake is now not just a snake, it is something else, and that's what I'm going for. So as a photographer that is obsessed with black water and wetlands, it's only fitting that I'd eventually end up in the most famous swamp of all, which is the Everglades. Because for me, I grew up in Gainesville, so I'd hear Fakahatchee and Loxahatchee and Big Cypress and Corkscrew. I'd hear those places, and I'd think, wow, this just sounds like an enchanted wonderland. I've got to go explore it. And so I finally did, and I started what then turned into a five-year project to document and to explain 
and to hopefully rewrite the Everglades narrative in maybe a new and more inspiring light. Because if you've ever talked about the Everglades with people, you say the word Everglades and they think, wow, this is a, you know, it's a hectic place. You have mosquitoes and alligators and now pythons everywhere. But it's not. It's serene. It's peaceful. It is beautiful. Little parts of the Everglades that still remain have this old Florida feel still intact. And they also think it's a national park. But the Everglades National Park is just that southern end of the system. The Everglades is actually an entire watershed that goes from the Kissimmee chain of lakes near Orlando all the way down 100 miles long and 60 miles wide, all the way down to Florida Bay. And Florida Bay is that last receiver of fresh water. So this is a story about water, <coughs> pure and simple, and all the different ecoregions that it crosses as it goes through and all the different species that depend on this flow of water. Well, if you know the story of water in Florida, and just like the story of water anywhere else in the U.S., it's a complicated story. And the story of the Everglades is intrinsically tied to those peaks and those valleys uh, of our relationship with the natural world. Because when we saw the Everglades for the first time, when our ancestors came down and they wanted to you know, put up houses and they wanted to be able to grow agriculture here, what they saw was water, endless water and they wanted to improve it. So what they wanted to do was to eventually take this and turn it into this. And they did. They did. They were very efficient at it. (coughs) So what they decided to do is to, to drain the wetlands and make way for agriculture enough to be able to have year round tomatoes for 300 million Americans or oranges for all of us. And we dramatically changed that system this watershed that is 100 miles long and 60 miles wide. We changed it because we started draining it. We took this river of grass, this beautiful uh, matrix of of sawgrass prairies and slow-moving water, and we diked it up and we changed it to the river of sugarcane. Over half a million acres that are now responsible for dumping exceedingly high levels of nutrients into the system, a system that is typically nutrient-poor. So how do we understand this system other than these broad sweeping stories and images? Well, for me as a, as a wildlife photographer, as a conservation photographer, what I like to do is to look at these systems independently and find, much like a, a writer would to pick a protagonist, that is representative of a system. Because what better way to understand uh, how a system works than, than through the wildlife that actually depends on it every single day to survive, right? Because if a system's failing, then that species is probably going to fail, and we're going to find reasons why. So for the northern Everglades around Lake Okeechobee, the ideal candidate is the, is the Everglades snail kite. Y'all know this bird? Very cool bird. So it has these broad wings that are equipped for soaring over these wetlands without expending much energy. And then they have these long talons because they only hunt one thing, and it's an apple snail. So they want to be able to pull this snail out of the water without getting wet, (coughs) take it to a tree, then with their long hooked bill, they'll (coughs) peel out the meat, pass the operculum, to be able to eat, eat that snail. So this is one of the most specialized raptors in the world, the most specialized. So it's depending on the snail, which the snail depends on this aquatic environment, this healthy wetland. Well, what did we do to Lake Okeechobee? This this lake that once expanded and contracted as the summer rains fell and then would dry in the winter, we diked it up. And we, we stopped those wetlands from being able to expand and contract those critical marshes that provided habitat for the apple snail. Well, as soon as we did that, snail's population dropped. And so what do you think happened? Yeah, thousands and thousands of kites went to around 400 nesting pairs today. Yeah. So we want people to care about the kite. So how do we get people to care about a bird they don't really know much about? We would go to extreme lengths and try to make a photo that might get people excited about it in a different way. And I brought a little video to show how we, how we go about these things.
Photographing the Everglades snail kite was definitely one of the most challenging and stressful projects I've ever taken on. The majority of their population exists in and around Lake Okeechobee, which is the seventh largest freshwater lake in the United States. It's a huge area. And unlike other raptors, the snail kite feeds on one source of food, just one, the apple snail. But the apple snail lives underwater most of the time, really only coming up just to breathe, mate, or lay eggs. So kites are constantly soaring over the vegetation, scanning and searching for this prey, which is about the size of a ping pong ball. So this bird is basically able to find a needle in a haystack. I had to find some unique way to photograph that. So I went to Lake Okeechobee. I knew it was gonna take a lot of preparation, but because of the size of the area, I also knew it was gonna take some sort of bottleneck. So I teamed up with state wildlife biologists and we built this submersible platform out of PVC, which would contain the snails just right at the top of the water column, along with a camera that I could trigger remotely. So day after day, I'm hauling all my gear out into the water. I'm just sitting in my canoe for nine hour shifts, just waiting, waiting. And it was miserable. And I, yeah, I began to get really discouraged when things were unsuccessful. You're left with your own thoughts and doubt really starts to creep in. Am I keeping the birds away? Is the camera keeping the birds away? And there's no way of knowing. And so you're constantly at battle with that part of you that just wants to say, and I should just go shoot this with a telephoto lens and just be done with it. Four days passed and I had nothing to show. And I actually started to think that the image was, it was impossible. But I decided to give it one more effort and so I returned to Lake Okeechobee. And after setting up the platform in a new flight line, I look off and I see a kite coming over the cattails. And I see him scanning and searching. And he gets right over the trap and he looks down and I see that he sees it and he beelines, he goes straight for the trap. Yes. <laughs> and in that moment, all those months of planning, waiting, all the sunburn, mosquito bites, suddenly, oh my God. they're all worth it. I can't believe it. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> this is crazy. What do you think, is that fun? Yeah, yeah. is it worth it? Yeah. I hope so, I hope so because it's a different glimpse. It's a new window into the world, which I already thought these birds were cool, but after doing this project, to me, they're way more fascinating because I, I learned things of how they would use the wind direction to fly in to grab snails. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't fly with the wind, they'd fly against it, so they would use propulsion as they grab a snail to come up. Pretty fascinating, so I'd have to keep changing the direction of things. I get to see what it looks like when a, a snail explodes off the water. Really cool. And then finally, again, that one frame that, that sums it up that would eventually become the, the cover of the book. And uh, just kind of those, one of those moments that you're just eternally grateful for, that it actually happened. And yeah, you've got to put the hours in, but very grateful for these kites. And someone was asking me earlier, if I'm going to talk about gators. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Because you can't talk about the Everglades if you don't talk about the gators. No one will trust you anymore. <laughs> and is it okay? Am I too close to Tallahassee to say that I love gators? I grew up loving gators. Go gators. Um, but what I like about gators is that well, they're ubiquitous now, but they're one of the, uh, the U.S.'s most successful conservation efforts because we brought them to near extinction, uh, and now they've rebounded to you know, millions of them, millions of them. So uh, we still have a complicated relationship with alligators, uh, but what I, what I enjoy is that even though we see them as these apex predators and these things that always dominate a system, they're just as much a part of the system as, as anything else. You know, they, they live and die and, uh, just like anything else does. But what's cool about the alligators in the Everglades is that they are actually different than the alligators we get up here because they are fit to survive in an area that is governed by this wet season and this dry season, the thing that defines the Everglades. 
So what they do, and what has given them the title, the architects of the Everglades, or the engineers of the Everglades, is that they actually physically alter the area around them. They dig out these areas called gator holes, and they do that because as the water starts to drop and dry up in the winter, you know, this is a reptile that needs to stay wet and it needs to be able to feed and forage. So it digs out these gator holes so it can stay wet and so it can forage. Now this also starts affecting other animals, which makes it a keystone species. So I wanted to go out. Sure, you can get plenty of photos and al of alligators in water, but I wanted the one thing that you don't really get in other places, and that's that seasonality of water, that dry as a bone habitat. And I found that in Big Cypress in one very, very dry year. And you would find these paths of desire leading out into this nucleus of, of muck, of this rotting fish and uric cesspit of alligators all hanging out. And I headed out, and I had a very, very good friend who agreed to do this with me, and we headed out into the middle of it to make that frame. <laughs> Still <a good> friend. <laughs> He's the best of friends. A friend that will hike out into a pit of 120 alligators is a friend you st stay very close to, or you make sure you're faster than, <laughs> 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 or both. And so this is the, this kind of the central Everglades. That's what dominates. The alligators dominate the central Everglades. And then finally, that water continues to move southward until it reaches Florida Bay. And Florida Bay is a fascinating ecosystem because it is the last stop of fresh water in the whole Everglades watershed. And it's fascinating for many reasons. Of course, you get these wonderful summer storms. A lot of people don't like to go down to the Everglades in the summer, but I think it's really great because you get these spectacular nuclear clouds that develop. And you also have mangroves all around Florida Bay. It's one of the largest contiguous stands of protected mangroves in the world, in the Western Hemisphere. And mangroves, although they look like a homogenous system on top, is when you, when you stick your head underwater in mangroves in Florida Bay and the Everglades, you're blown away by the colors and the diversity of, of sponges and algaes and invertebrates. Fascinating place. I'll go out there and I would collect these samples and bring a little field studio so you could just focus on even the smallest things, a little inch-long mermaid's wine glass, make it look like a zen painting, cool macroalgae or the lettuce sea slug that photosynthesizes its own energy. That's fun. But mangroves are really interesting too because they're a nursery. They're a haven for invertebrates and fish. And there's these areas, there are these tidal areas that they're as dry as a bone at low tide, but then high tide on a full moon, four feet of water <laughs> comes up and these horseshoe crabs come in. And what follows the horseshoe crabs are dozens and dozens of, of little baby lemon sharks little pups about that big. These are nurseries, important nurseries, which is why they're protected. But Florida Bay also has bottlenose dolphins, the only dolphins in the world that will use tools that will actually use the sediment to create uh, dirt circles to entrap their prey. And what makes Florida Bay truly unique is that it is shallow. It is a shallow estuary. And when you have a shallow estuary in subtropical Florida, shallow means very shallow and subtropical, a lot of light. So you get these fields and miles and miles of submerged aquatic vegetation. And this submerged aquatic vegetation is what attracts all the fish and what attracts eventually all the birds. So you get these large migrating uh, flocks of American white pelicans, so much that they actually become islands sometimes. Yeah. And the islands in Florida Bay are really special. It is peppered with these mangrove islands. And these mangrove islands, when you're separated that far from mainland, creates this high level of endemism. Yeah, funky looking Buddha belly birds. So these birds nest on these mangrove islands because they're safe from, from mammalian predators. There are no ground predators. And so many birds have even started begin to feel really cavalier and they'll actually start nesting on the ground. Uh, these ospreys build their nests on the ground. Very cool. Again, remote cameras. But there's one bird in particular that represents Florida Bay, especially to me. And this is the roseate spoonbill. Yeah. I love these birds. They're so cool. And they're beautiful. Until you get to the face area. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're kind of like, wow, what happened? <laughs> so close. 
<laughs> but these birds are fascinating. These birds are fascinating because we had, you know, thousands and thousands of them in the southern Everglades. And then when we first arrived, we, we noticed that we had thousands and thousands of them. And like many other wading birds, we hunted them to near extirpation, all for the mil millinery trade or the plume hat trade. So luckily at the turn of the 20th century, we then banned the plume trade because we had taken thousands and thousands and thousands of them and we brought them down to two nesting pairs. Yeah. Two. And it's because their pelts were worth more than gold at the time. So highly valuable. So what did we do? We made a policy. We said it's illegal. We're going to protect these birds. Nature matters. Birds matter. Biodiversity matters. And they started rebounding. They started coming back. Yeah, we made a policy and it worked. And so as the birds started coming back, we started paying attention. What's going on with these birds? Why are they, you know, what's their biology? What's their behavior like? And what the biologists began to realize is that these birds start timing their nesting at a very specific time. They wait for the winter. Well, why do they wait for the winter? Well, these birds, unlike egrets and herons, because egrets and herons, they'll, they'll pierce their prey, right? They don't have a spoon for a face. They have a knife. They, they, they spear it. Spoonbills are tactile feeders. So if you've ever seen them feeding around, they have to move their head back and forth until they can touch what they eat. Well, if you're going to raise babies, and if you're going to be able to feed enough to not only feed yourself, but to then to also feed your young, you're going to wait till food base is abundant. And food base for fish is abundant when those water levels start dropping. And as water levels drop, those fish are culled into these ponds, into these pools, so they can finally feed enough to feed themselves and their young. Well, so these birds depend on the very thing that makes the Everglades the Everglades, a seasonality of water. Wet season, dry season, and productive estuaries. Yes. Yes, yeah, so their numbers came back. 800, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 birds are coming back. They're doing great. And then in the middle of the 20th century, we messed up the water. We stopped two-thirds of that fresh water from reaching Florida Bay. And Florida Bay is an estuary. And if you deprive it of two-thirds of fresh water, bad things happen. Very bad things happen. And this is more like the Spoonbill story today. We're down to around 80 nesting pairs in Florida Bay. Yeah, because we've disrupted the system so much. We stopped the majority of that fresh water from actually reaching its source. And salinity increases and you get a collapse in the SAV. <coughs> and so it is easy to stick your head in the sand and say, well, yep, we're just not good at stuff. We can't manage nature. And it's easy to say, well, they're just fragile. They're pink birds and they have spoons. But that's not true because there are pieces of this system that are still intact, that are still just waiting to be put back together again. And this is what's so fascinating to me about South Florida and this Everglades system is that you, you have this unstoppable force of mankind that is meeting that immovable object of tropical nature that just refuses to fail, that will do anything it can to survive. And that is fascinating to me. Because it's at this frontier, it's at this borderland that we have to ask ourselves, what is biodiversity worth? What is the value of our drinking water? And fortunately, after decades of debate, finally, we're starting to act on some of these questions. We're starting to bring more fresh water back by lifting up Tamiami Trail, by diverting more water back to Florida Bay, but it is slow. And we need people's support. We need people to know about it. We need people to care about it. And there, fortunately, there are scientists that are dedicating their lives to this, spending their whole lives getting this science right so we can say irrefutably, this is what it needs. Please just fix this system. And what we're finding out here uh, in the Everglades is the same thing we know here in Pensacola. A healthy environment means a vibrant economy. These things are linked. And the best thing people ask me to do, they say, well, what can I do to help? And I tell them is just get outside. Get out there. See it for yourself. Experience it. Let your dollars speak for your, what you think. You know, hire a fishing guide. Because you hire a fishing guide, you tell the state that protecting wilderness not only makes economic sense, but ecological sense as well. It is fun to do. Just get out. I like to hang hammocks in trees. Yeah, that's fun. Get out there. Do it. Relax. Enjoy it. Get to see the old Florida the way it should be seen. And to put my money where my mouth is, last night I slept out in one of y'all's backyards. <laughs> you recognize that lighthouse? 
is Gulf Shores. I even had a friend come and accompany me. And again, I go out to shoot this stuff and I am rewarded by all kinds of byproduct, things that I didn't expect to see. Beautiful scenes where you guys live is so incredible. That storm that came through, fascinating, led to all this beautiful dynamic light. The least turns are nesting right now. Go check them out. What you have in your backyard is special and it is worth protecting. It is worth advocating for. And yeah, we don't have mountains on our skyline, but we got other things. What we have in Florida is not the Rockies. It's not Yellowstone. It's a different kind of wild, and it's a special brand of wild. It's, it's the kind I am proud to bring friends down from the upstates and let them see it because I can see that excitement get audible on their face when they see stuff like this, and they just say, wow, y'all have this, and we do. We've just got to take care of it. And the best way, I think, is to reestablish that personal connection with nature. To get outside and allow it to creep into your toes, let the sand get under your fingernails, and care about it. Now, I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite quotes, and it's from Margaret Mead. And it's, Never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have some time for uh, for a question and answers. Is it? Yes, right behind you, Michelle. Thank you for a wonderful ad- adventure, a lifetime experience. Thank you. Years ago, there were, there were freshwater issues in central Florida, and Bob Graham, the governor, came to Pensacola to make a presentation. And I asked him, I said, Governor Graham, do you foresee a time when we'll have to limit population in Florida because of the freshwater issues? And he said, maybe tongue-in-cheek, he said, ever since Ponce de Leon got here, there have been angst about uh, population control. And he said it will never happen in my lifetime. And I know you're not a hydrologist, but do you foresee a time when we have to mimic our Oregon friends and say, come to play and don't stay? Do you ever see a time when Florida will have to say, have to say that population control is essential to preserve what you've been talking about tonight? Well, I could never see a uh, Florida tourism industry not promoting to come and live here and promoting its beautiful beaches and its sunshine. It's a good question. Um, yeah, tongue-in-cheek, modest proposal type stuff. I don't, I don't know. I think the, the issue is that we, we don't have, uh, r- right now we don't, uh, I'm hesitant to say this, but we don't have a water shortage problem. What we have is a water management problem. We, we water our lawns, we dump them with fertilizers. In the, in the Everglades, it's not that we're drinking all that water that's supposed to reach Florida Bay. We're dumping it all east and west out the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie. We are not managing it for the natural systems. We're managing it for what's convenient for us, and we're using these archaic systems. So I think that, yeah, we can do it, and I think it can support more people in Florida, but we've just got to do it more intelligently. We've got to let science dictate where people should be, what, what ecosystems are at risk, and what corridors and natural systems we need to protect above that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Michelle? Yep. Uh, Do you ever give uh, presentations to uh, developers? (laughs) (laughs) Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is we don't, we all live in homes, some type of home. We all drink water. We all eat food. It's not saying that development's bad. It's saying that it has to be done smarter, and it has to be done better, and there have to be the regulatory agencies uh, to be able to tell us what smarter and what better is. And we could be a model for the rest of the country. If we heal the Everglades, if we heal our springs, everyone's going to look to us and say, well, how did Florida did it? You know, how did they do it? What do we? So, yeah, I think, sure, why not? I think developers need to hear it too. Yes, sir. 
Matt, how, how are you funded to do all this wonderful work? Um, well, I accept donations. No. Uh, <laughs> no. So for different stories, I work with different magazines. The Swallowtail Kite story was done with uh, Nature Conservancy magazine. Sometimes I'll take on personal projects and I'll look for funders and things like that. But a lot of times it's with magazines. Um, the majority of the Everglades work was just just me. Um, and then I'd find, you know, little ways of funding separate projects. That's Thank our speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>